going to teach tonight about the church. And I kind of opened with it, maybe spilled the beans a little bit, but I am I'm so excited to be a part of the church. Uh, and I'm, I'm so excited to be a part of this church. Uh, now, I, I am both a part of it, uh, but I, I, if I have not voiced it in a while, I want to voice it. Uh, it, is, it is humbling and uh, an incredible honor to get to be where I'm at in life leading this, this great collection of individuals. Um, Jesus Church is made up of some of the finest people uh, in, in all of Pentecost. I am persuaded of that. And I'm talking about you. Uh, you are some of the finest people in all of Pentecost. Amen. Not a single amen. It's okay. Go ahead and pat your neighbor on the back and tell him he's talking about you. And I'm talking about you too. Amen. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 13. When Jesus came into the coasts of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? His first question was, Who do the multitudes say that I am? But the next question was, Who do you say that I am? This world has a lot of things to say about Jesus. If you polled the crowd today, uh, you're going to get more answers. Uh, in fact, there were some more answers that could have been given uh, to Jesus in that time frame. The Pharisees uh, said it was by, the, by Beelzebub that he did cast out devils. Uh, and so they had a strong opinion about who Jesus was. And so it would be in culture today. Some would proclaim him as maybe a, a prophet some would say he was a teacher. Some would say he was a figure that was elevated by his disciples to a position that, uh, that he never intended to hold. But Jesus then asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. There's a couple of things about the church that we need to know right from the get-go. Number one, it is His church. It is not our church. It is not my church. It is not the board's church. It's not the voting member's church. It is His church. Now, when we speak of church tonight, we are talking of the church at large. We're talking the church globally. We're talking the church around the world and throughout the ages. But Jesus said and Jesus declared that he would build his church. Others have built churches and others have built denominations, but there still remains only one church. There is a, an organization of which we are a part, of course you are familiar with, of the United Pentecostal Church, and I'm thankful to be a part of that organization. Uh, but the United Pentecostal Church is not the entirety of the church of Jesus Christ. Throughout all of the ages, there have been believers that have held to the doctrine of the Bible. God has always had believers. God has always had a church. 
There have been moments of time throughout the history over the last 2,000 years throughout human history where perhaps the flame burned a little less bright than at other moments, but I believe there has always been an apostolic witness throughout all of, all of this last 2,000 years of people who have believed in the revelation of Jesus Christ. They have believed in the necessity of baptism in Jesus' name and have received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. There were moments throughout history, and in fact, there are still moments going on right now where people would, for preaching what the apostles preached, have been persecuted and have been sought to be destroyed. But as Jesus declared, I will build my church. His church was built upon the rock. The rock, yes, Peter is a rock, that is Petros. But Jesus is not speaking solely on Peter. He's speaking about the revelation that Peter espouses in that moment. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. When Peter utters that line, Peter is speaking forth for the first time as one of the disciples, an understanding of the identity of who Jesus is. When he calls him the Christ, he is speaking to his position. He is declaring him to be the long-awaited Messiah, the one that was promised to come. When he declares him to be the Son of the living God, he declares him to be deity, to be the Father incarnate, to be God or the Jehovah of the Old Testament manifested in the flesh. And that uh, is the revelation that Jesus proclaimed he would build his church on. The next thing we need to know about the church is that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church of the living God. God is going to have a church And I want to be a part of it. Let's move ahead a little bit in Scripture. This is Jesus beginning to talk about the church. But in Acts chapter 2, we see the church established. Of course, many in this room are familiar with the context of this portion of Scripture. But if you're not, this is the day where the church moves from a group of disciples to becoming the established church of Jesus Christ. At this point in your biblical narrative, Jesus has been crucified, he's been buried, he's risen from the dead, and he has appeared to his disciples, he's appeared to greater than 500 believers, and he has told them to go and wait in Jerusalem because there's a promise coming from the heavens. And so Acts finds 120 believers gathered together in an upper room. And the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 2 that there was a sudden sound from heaven and God poured out His Spirit just like He promised to do and everybody in the room was filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost speaking in other tongues. I look forward to the day. We've been in moments, we've been in settings, we've been in services where we've been oh so close to being in one mind and one accord. But if we ever would slip into a place where 100% of the people in the room are in one mind and one accord, there is no telling what the power of God will do. And so the church was never confined to an upper room. God's church is not confined to a building. God's church transcends buildings. I'm thankful for buildings. I'm thankful that God allowed us to have this building for a miraculous price and that we can be a debt-free church. I rejoice that the church in Millbank was given a building. I rejoice that God has opened opportunities in Brookings and in Webster for the church to have a building. There is a blessing when there's a building, but the church spilled out of the building into the streets. And people got a little curious about what was going on at the establishment of the church. And so they began to point, they began to ask questions. 
And so Peter stands up with the eleven and begins to preach. And we pick up his sermon in Acts chapter 2 and verse 37. Essentially, he preaches to the gathered crowd that this same revelation he had of Jesus in Matthew chapter 16, he preaches that to the gathered crowd and adds to them this same Jesus who was made Lord and Christ, you crucified him. And this information that they received, this revelation at the preaching of Peter, because faith came by hearing and hearing by the word of God, it pricked them in their hearts and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? This is the second question to the church on the first day that the first church was formed. Do you know what the first question was? The first question was, what meaneth this? If you ever want to get to what shall, we, what shall we do, you've got to pass through what meaneth this. There has to be something that strikes curiosity inside of them. When the church was founded... It was the Holy Ghost. It was vibrant worship. It was people lost and drunk, out drunk appearing out in the streets. And that sparked the question, what meaneth this? And so Peter begins to tell them, what shall we do? Here's what you do. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. And here's where the church experiences its first building. Jesus founded his church, and now the same day he builds on his church, just like he promised to do. And then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about three thousand souls and they continued steadfastly in the apostles doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and prayers and fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles and all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need and they Continuing daily with one accord, there's that phrase again, it is so important, it is so necessary, with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. We read today of Jesus declaring he will establish his church and Jesus beginning and establishing his church. There is no other record than the book of Acts of the historical acts of the apostles when Jesus founds his church. When we look at how the church should look, we need to look to the book of Acts. When we look at how the church should behave, we turn to the book of Acts. When we look at how the church should interact with the world, we turn to the book of Acts. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12 tells us something else about the church. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free. And have all been made to drink into one spirit, for the body is not one member, but many. I am thankful today that this body is one body. I'm thankful today that God saw fit to add you and your giftings and your callings to this particular local church, this 
church for Watertown, this piece of his body in Watertown. Together we're a body, and then this body is part of the church. Together, all of our talents, all of our anointings, all of our callings, all of our skills uh, make up the whole here in Watertown. Your giftings are needed here. Your giftings need to be unleashed and unlocked in this place. This is not a church where one or two people are to run the show. This is a church that respects, that empowers, that tries to draw out, that tries to pull out, that tries to elevate, that tries to perfect the giftings and callings of others. You are not here to serve my calling. I'm here to help you to step into your calling so that them outside, they that have not yet heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, can hear the gospel and come and respond to it and be added to the church. You are necessary in this body. What's more, this body is necessary for you. If you sever the hand from the body, the body may survive if you can control the bleeding, but the hand will not survive without the body. Now, the body will be permanently handicapped. I know, a, I know just, just enough to have a little bit of authority here, okay? My permanent handicap of my stub finger don't look, I'm hideous, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm a mangled freak. It did not bother. There's two times when it bothers me. When I'm trying to delete while typing. And when I'm wearing gloves when it's cold outside. My little stub finger gets cold duck hunting. And I got I to gotta carry a propane heater. And my blind buddies mock me for getting cold. Uh, so those are the two times. But hear me, just the absence of a pinky tip is felt by my body in particular situations. That pinky died when it was severed from the body. So you and I, if we find ourselves separated from the body of Christ, from the church, we will die in isolation. We will not survive. But the body will continue. However, there will be moments of time where the body will feel your absence. Uh, right now in the Holy Ghost, I just want to reassure somebody, you're not here by accident. You have been gifted. You have been uniquely called. You have been anointed to be attached to this body. And you are gifted to supply something to this body. Your absence is felt. Uh, your, your loss would be felt in the event of you leaving. It would be felt. That does not mean that God does not transplant members to a different body. God will do that from time to time. Uh, and that is up to him. That is not up to me. But when God places you in a body, you do not have to fuss or fight or worry about what part of the church you are. If you're the foot, be the best foot you could ever be. If you're the hand, be the best hand you could ever be. I've got two left feet on this body, but I'm thankful to be a part of the body of Christ where God has knit us together exactly how he wants us to be. And if you're not supplying to the body, you're withholding from them. That's not a condemnatory statement. I'm challenging and encouraging somebody to allow the body to pull the giftings out of you. Every joint is to supply what it's supposed to supply to the body. We're talking about the church today. But one thing that the church continued in was the apostles' doctrine. There was fellowship. I believe that Jesus' church excels at fellowship. Don't believe me? If I canceled cleaning tonight, you'd all still stay here for 40 minutes gabbing. It's because you like each other. And you spend time with each other outside of church. In fact, sometimes we like each other so much that we got to re remember to spend time with people that aren't a part of the body. 
so that we can connect them to the body so that they can experience fellowship together. Fellowship is not just hanging out. It's that kindred spirit you have with the body member across the aisle from you. Why? We're all baptized into one body by one spirit. It ought to be easy for you to spend time with your church mates. You do not need to wait for, well, this isn't in my notes, but hey, we're having fun. You do not need to wait for somebody to reach out to you. Reach out to them and say, hey, let's get together. There are over 60 one another commandments in your New Testament to the church. If you wanted a homework assignment, there's a good one for you. One another, one to another. Go ahead, look them up. You'll find them scattered all throughout the epistles, all throughout the book of Acts. One to another, love one another, honor one another, serve one another, pray for one another. It's all in there. Why? Because the church was fellowshipping. But there was... There was something that the church rallied around, and it was doctrine. Tonight, we're going to talk about four specific aspects of doctrine. We're going to talk about the mighty God in Christ. We're going to talk about baptism in Jesus' name. We're going to talk about the infilling of the Holy Ghost. And we're going to talk about holiness in lifestyle. Why? Because these were pillars upon which the apostles' doctrine or the church of the apostles were built. This was what the first church preached. And if you want to be in the church that Jesus built, this is what you must preach. This is what you must adhere to. And so we begin tonight with this. The early church preached it, and we will preach it. There is not a division of persons in the Godhead, but the Godhead is the mighty God in Christ Jesus. Peter's confession of Jesus Christ was declared by Jesus himself to be the rock of revelation upon which the church would be built. And so we go first to Isaiah 9 and 6. Over the next few weeks and months, we're going to spend extensive time on each of these. Why? Because each of these areas is under attack in modern Christendom. And to be a part of the church, we've got to know who he is. We've got to know the head of the church. We've got to know how to enter the church. We've got to know how to live once we're in the church. And if it was taught in the Bible and we look to the teaching of the first century church and we look to the teaching of the apostles, then we've got to live, we've got to preach, we've got to teach that same teaching in this 21st century context. If it was good enough for Peter, James, and John, then I want to be a part of that church. And so the mighty God in Christ. In Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, there is, actually just as a, as a disclaimer, from now until about 8 o'clock, I would encourage you, I've, I've said this before and so you might giggle, I, I'm serious, I would encourage you to have every scripture I'm about to use memorized. You might as well. And we got all kinds of other useless information stored up there. Why do you want to memorize this? Because tonight we're just going to take a quick overview of four core doctrines and have some, some basic scripture in, in our arsenal, in our quiver, ready to draw on, ready to stand on, ready to build on. Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. The Son that would be born was to be known as the mighty God and the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. We know, of course, that this Son that was born was given a name, and that name has been declared to be above every name, and that name was... 
Isaiah 9 or 7 and 14, therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. In Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21, an angel is speaking to Mary and begins to declare, she shall bring forth a son and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel. Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all of this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the, or through the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Uh, the mighty God of the Old Testament became Emmanuel, God with us, uh, when Jesus was knit together by the spirit in the womb of Mary. I'm so thankful for the understanding. I'm so thankful for the knowledge of who Jesus is. John would declare in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and that word was God. In John 1 and 14, he would go on and say, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word that was God from the beginning, from the very beginning, God knew that he would eventually have to incarnate himself in flesh and walk among you and I. And John would declare that this word, this logos, this plan, this idea in the mind of God was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory the glory is of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth uh, finally God uh, who is a spirit was able to be looked upon in the person of Jesus Christ when the word uh, was made flesh and dwelt among us when the word was made flesh and Emmanuel God uh, with us we beheld finally the glory of our God Corinthians declared in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 19, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Why was it given to us? Because we're the church. Why was it given to us? Because the church is his body in this earth. We now have Christ inside of us by the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And so now the mission of reconciliation has passed to the church of Jesus Christ. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8. Paul would write and say, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy, through vain deceit, after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of this world, and not after Christ. Let's read this next verse together. In fact, I don't want you just to read it. I want you to declare it off the screen as truth, as inspired word of God. As they put verse 9 on the screen. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. This is talking about Jesus Christ. And in Jesus Christ dwelt not a portion of God, not a piece of God, not a third of God, but all the fullness of the Godhead dwelt bodily in Christ Jesus. Jesus. Uh, all the word was made flesh uh, and dwelt among us. What's more, uh, we are complete in him, uh, which is the head of all principality and power. Uh, we are made complete uh, in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, why? Because there's no greater name. Uh, there's no greater name than the name of Jesus. Uh, there's no greater name uh, than the name of Jesus. Jesus is the incarnation of the Father. He is both fully God and fully man. From the moment of conception in the womb of Mary, deity and humanity intertwined. I don't have it on the screen here, 
But in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4 would be another great one that you could write down and memorize. It says, For when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law. That's important for us to understand. Why? Because it tells us that there was a beginning to the sonship. It was not until the moment that the Spirit conceived in Mary, the, the, the child Jesus Christ, uh, that the sonship began. It came in the fullness of time, made of a woman, made under the law. God incarnated himself in the womb of Mary. Jesus was both fully divine and fully man. That is what allows him, as Paul would write in Timothy, to be the one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. He was able to be a high priest for you and I because he was tempted in all points as we are, yet he was without sin. And he, he, he overcame death, hell, and the grave. I'm so thankful for the knowledge of who Jesus is. James chapter 2 and verse 19 lets us know why this is an important revelation. Thou believest that there is one God, as the totality of Scripture proclaims, uh, the central commandment in all uh, of the law of Moses. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, uh, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. All of Scripture testifies to the fact, uh, but there is but one God. Uh, and so James says, you do well, because the devils also believe and they tremble at that revelation. It's important for us to build upon this doctrine because Jesus himself declares in John chapter 8 and verse 24, I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins, for if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Now, John, this is one of the I am statements of John. In the King James, that word he is in italics. That means it was added, uh, it prayerfully added by the translators to attempt to make it make sense in context. But what Jesus is declaring is not simply that he is he, the Messiah. He is declaring more than that. He is saying, I am. Am. I'm the same I am that spoke to Moses in a burning bush. I'm the same I am that came down on a mountain with fire. I'm the same I am that guided them through the wilderness. I'm the same I am that supplied bread from heaven. I'm the same I am that split open the Red Sea. Before all of this was, he said in another portion in the same chapter, before Abraham was, I am am. Jesus was simply showing them the revelation of himself. Before your father Abraham, I am. I was. I am. I is. I will be. I'm always going to be. I am. I'm the self-existent, eternal, always will be one. Right now, I'm in flesh in front of you, but that's who I am. And they picked up stones to stone him. But when you have an understanding of who Jesus is, there is freedom from your sins. As the church would declare in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, also not going to be on the screen, but you should probably write that down and commit it to memory. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Closely related to the revelation of the mighty God in Christ is baptism in Jesus' name. When you understand the power of the name of Jesus, when you understand that when you speak the name of Jesus, there is no aspect of the deity of God that you are not calling upon, then baptism in his name only makes sense. Jesus would declare in Matthew 28, 18, he spake unto them saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Why does he have all power? Because he's God. All of the Godhead dwelt bodily in the man that made that statement. And so he said, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. What are we teaching them? We're teaching them about the mighty God in Christ. Watertown must know about the mighty God in Christ Jesus. 
And he goes on and declares, once you've taught them, baptized them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Now, we know that the disciples understood what he was saying because they either obeyed or they disobeyed. In Mark chapter 16 and verse 16, Jesus says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Baptism is necessary for salvation. It is not just an external sign of my salvation. It is not just how you join a congregation. It is how you join the church. Baptism is a portion of our salvation. It is necessary for salvation. We read already, but we return to when they asked Peter and the 11 apostles standing with him, what do we need to do? Peter declared to them all of the teaching of Jesus Christ on salvation in one perfect verse. He encapsulates all of it and he says, repent. We turn from our mistakes. We turn towards Jesus. But we don't stop at repentance. We are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And then it's a promise we shall receive the baptism or the gift of the Holy Ghost. This lets us know that Peter and the 11 apostles standing next to him understood fully what Jesus said when he told them to baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. They understood, they knew, and they practiced baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. Paul would write in Romans chapter 6 and verse 4, Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. Who's the him? It's Jesus. You read the context of the surrounding verses, and Paul is speaking directly of Jesus Christ. Baptism by immersion in water in the name of Jesus preserves uh, this continuation. It preserves this example. We are completely put under the water just as Jesus was completely put under the earth. And like as Jesus was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also shall walk in newness of life. Baptism in Jesus' name uh, works for us the remission or the washing away of sins. Uh, the method matters. The name matters. You must be buried completely in the water and the name of Jesus must be spoken over you all throughout the book of Acts if you want to look through it go through it again you will never find somebody baptized in the titles Father Son and Holy Ghost they always spoke the name of the Lord Jesus Christ why because when you call the name of Jesus all of God dwelt bodily in Jesus Christ again baptism is for salvation 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21. Peter is writing and he's talking about Noah's ark. And oh my goodness, I just looked at the time. Whoo! All right, somebody put like a piece of tape over the clock. Peter is he's talking about Noah's ark. Noah's ark was a type, it was a shadow, it was a figure of that which was to come, of baptism. Peter is making that illustration for us, not just me. Everything that was obedient to God got in the ark. Water came, and everything that was obedient rose out of the water. Everything that was disobedient stayed out of the ark and stayed under the water. And he says this, The like figure whereunto baptism doth now also save us. You are not saved until you've submitted to water baptism in Jesus' name for the remission of your sins. But here's the beauty of it. It's unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Uh, anybody can repent of their sins uh, and obey water baptism in Jesus' name uh, and go down in the waters of baptism and come out uh, and receive the promised gift of the Holy Ghost that Jesus said he'll do. And it is effectual in our salvation. My past cannot follow me out of the water. 
You might have been a meth head. You might have been sleeping around. You might have been the Samaritan woman with five husbands. But when you're baptized in Jesus' name and you come up out of that water, you come up white and pure as snow. Though your sins be as scarlet, they're white as snow. And so like Paul recounting his own conversion experience in Acts chapter 22 and verse 16, he said, Why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And baptism has been under attack for thousands of years. But the early church practiced it. The early church preached it. And I want to be a part of what the early church was a part of. Uh, And so I'm here to flat-footed declare to you today uh, in Watertown in 2024, uh, if Peter, James, and John baptized in Jesus' name by immersion, uh, we're going to baptize in Jesus' name by immersion uh, for the saving of a soul uh, and for the washing away of sins. Another pillar of the early church was the infilling of the Holy Ghost is evidenced by speaking in other tongues. Jesus would speak in John chapter 3 and declare this, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water, that's baptism, and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. I don't know about you, I'd kind of like to be part of the kingdom of God. It sounds pretty nice. I'd like to be there. He explains to Nicodemus that which is flesh or born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The argument in this world of so many is I was born this way. We don't have to run from that in the slightest. You don't have to be embarrassed about that. You don't even have to disagree with that. Okay, you were born that way. The psalmist would write, I was was, uh, born in sin and shapen in iniquity. Great. I was born to cuss and fuss and be disobedient to my parents and put any substance I could find in my body. That was my tendency. But guess what? You're not called to live how you were born. We're called to be born again. And Jesus said, don't marvel that I say unto you, you must be born again. So you might be born with a predilection towards alcoholism. You might be born homosexual. You might be born and and face and, and through environment come into some of these sins. But guess what? You can be born again of a heavenly seed. You don't have to be bound by what you were born. You might have been born with a last name that brings shame, but you can be born with a new name. And so Jesus explains a little bit about the Spirit. He says, the wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest this. He's talking about the baptism of the Spirit. You hear the sound of it, But you can't tell whence it cometh or whither it goeth. Here in South Dakota, we know a little bit about the wind. Anybody hear the wind blowing today? Anybody see some evidence of the wind blowing today? You saw trees, leafless trees flapping. I saw my neighbor's garbage can going down the street. Brother Shelster, you're going to need to pick that up later. Just kidding, it wasn't his. There's evidence of the wind, but did anybody see the wind? We didn't see the wind. But Jesus says this, so it is, or so is, everyone that is born of the Spirit. Every single one that is born of the Spirit, you hear the sound thereof, but you can't tell where it came from or where it's going. So it is with everyone. Jesus just told us there is a unique distinct and universal sign of baptism of being born in the Spirit. And you'll hear the sound of it. And so it's no surprise to us then when the apostles get to the book of Acts, they're always talking about the Holy Ghost. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 4, the Bible says they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The baptism of the Holy Ghost with the initial evidence of the infilling of tongues is for 
all, uh, and all will have the initial evidence of speaking in other tongues. It was the practice of the early church. Again, we're going to go through this extensively. We'll go through doctrine by doctrine throughout the coming months and weeks. But in Acts chapter 10 and verse 44, watch this. Peter's preaching now to the Gentiles. Jesus is building his church. He's preaching to the Gentiles, and while it says, While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision, the Jews, that came, or as many as believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. How did they know the Holy Ghost was poured out on the Gentiles? The sound that you hear, so it is of everyone that's born of the Spirit. The next verse tells us, For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. The, the Jews spoke in tongues, the Samaritans spoke in tongues, the Gentiles spoke in tongues. All 12 of the disciples who became the apostles spoke in tongues. Mary, the mother of Jesus, spoke in tongues and was baptized in Jesus' name. All of the brothers of Jesus spoke in tongues and were baptized in Jesus' name. If it was good enough for Mary, I think I'll just appropriate it to me right now. In Acts chapter 19, it was so specific to the church. It was such common practice that Paul, all these years later, after the day of Pentecost, we are talking a space of decades later, shows up in the town of Ephesus and finds a group of disciples. And what's his first question for this group of believers? Have ye received the Holy Ghost since you believed? He said, look, I know you believe, but have you ever been filled with the Holy Ghost? And the disciples were confused. They're like, man, I haven't even heard about this Holy Ghost. Pause for a second and think about this. These men have lived for decades as disciples of John the Baptist, faithfully. John the Baptist has been dead for decades. And here they are in Ephesus, faithfully living without knowledge of the Holy Ghost. Kind of puts my own struggles into context a little bit, doesn't it? Here they are in a city sold to idolatry, faithfully following what little light they have. Never be ashamed to offer somebody greater revelation. Because if they'll grab a hold of it, their whole world in Jesus Christ is about to open up. Do not despise what they have. Do not belittle what they have. In fact, Acts chapter 10 says some very high words about Cornelius. He was a good man. He was an honest man. He fasted. He worshiped. He gave. But he still needed to be born again. And so Paul teaches them about baptism. He rebaptizes them in the name of Jesus Christ. And it says in verse 6 of Acts chapter 19, Then Paul laid his hands upon them. The Holy Ghost came upon them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. All these decades later, it was still the normative practice for new believers to speak with other tongues. Jude chapter 1 and verse 20 says, But ye, brother, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. We doing okay? I am, I'm actually almost done. We got like 10 more minutes. 10 more minutes? The sound man said good, and I got one thumbs up, everybody else is golden, okay. Everybody else is too nice to quit. Good, because we just got to the next pillar that we need to get to, holiness of lifestyle. There are those today that want to preach the new birth experience with zero emphasis on holiness of lifestyle. But if you want to be a part of the church that Jesus is building, you must hold to the teaching and the practice of the first century church. You must teach what Scripture teaches. And so the church would declare in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 15, 
But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. That is, all manner of our lifestyle. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Very briefly, a definition of holiness as it pertains to you and I would be separation from this world, from sin, and dedication unto God. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul writes, Wherefore, come out, separate from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a father unto you, and you will be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Let's listen to what Jesus says about his church in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That sounds like God is expecting his church to be a holy church. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 20, For ye are bought with a price. How many of you know that you were purchased with a price? Acts chapter 20 and verse 28 tells us it was the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. When was the only time that God had blood? When he incarnated himself in Christ Jesus. Uh, And so he shed his blood. Uh, You were bought with the price of blood. Uh, You were not bought with money. You were not bought with something so simple. You were bought with the pure blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, And so Paul says, therefore, because you were purchased, glorify God in your body and in your spirit. Which are God's? What does this tell us about God's expectation of holiness? It is both internal and external. It has to do with my attitudes, my thoughts, my desires, and it absolutely has to do with what I do with this physical body. What you do with your flesh matters. Why? Because he purchased your flesh, and someday he'll redeem your flesh completely and glorify you, and you'll be together forever with him. But But as for now, he's put his spirit inside of you to help you separate from this world and dedicate yourself to him. There were some other pillars of the first century church. The word. Psalm 119 and verse 89 declares forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. We do not get to subtract, we do not get to delete, we do not get to remove portions of the word that we don't understand, that we don't agree with, that don't fit our modern sensibilities. Why? Because Paul would write to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 and declare that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, so that the man of God may be perfect or complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That means all of the counsel of Scripture was given to you to perfect you, to complete you, to help you to be thoroughly furnished unto good works. The early church had a hunger for the Word of God, and I'm thankful to be a part of a 21st century church that is desperately hungry for the Word of God. You're here on a Wednesday night because you want to hear the Word of God preached. Another pillar of the first century church is prayer and fasting. It was essential for them. Jesus himself practiced it, and you and I will practice it. If we are to be a church with any power, with any authority, with any dominion in the spiritual realm and in the natural realm, then we must remain a church of prayer and fasting. I'm thankful to be a part of a local assembly where it is not at all uncommon throughout the day for somebody to be in this building praying. If only you could see what I see, the constant flow of people in and out of this church coming to pray. Throughout my workday, it is with regularity that I'll be interrupted from 
whatever I'm working on to hear somebody either in this room or in that room or in the basement or in a Sunday school room lifting up their voice in prayer. It is with regularity that there are people fasting, uh, voluntarily abstaining from food. Why? Uh, Not just to lose weight, uh, but to get a hold of something in God. Uh, Jesus would declare that there are some uh, devils that do not go out but by prayer and fasting. Uh, But I'm so proud to be a part of an apostolic church in the 21st century that has a hold on prayer, uh, that has a hold on fasting. The first century church had They had a revelation of the power of giving. And if we could ever fully come into the revelation of giving, this is a giving church. This is a giving church. But we're not Acts 2 givers. Now, nobody was ever called. Jesus never said, sell everything you have as a blanket statement to the church. But there was such a singleness of heart that they sold and they gave. We see that practice discontinued before the end of Acts, but we don't see sacrificial giving discontinued. The tithe is the beginning. It's the expectation. That's not sacrificial giving. That's expectation. But I'm thankful to be a part of a church. Did you, you, guys, you guys remember just it was in March of, of 2023. In this room... This church gave $68,000 in one offering. Not just in pledges, in money in hand. It was in August this church sent out over $16,000 to support missionaries, to support youth ministry, to support so many other things. It was this auction last Sunday. People were spending $200 on briskets. And in one moment we raised $3,500 for the kingdom. That's giving. And week after week, moment after moment, just like the first century church, people are pouring back into the kingdom of God. It's not about the dollars. It's about the generosity of a heart. Uh, It's about shattering a poverty mindset that has so many bound in this region and declaring, my God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Uh, If I give with a generous attitude and spirit, I don't even care. Uh, He might let me go hungry once or twice, but I've never seen the righteous forsake nor his seed begging bread. These are pillars of the first century church and they're going to be pillars of Jesus' church going forward. Let's all stand together in this place. I hustled to a close. In Revelation chapter 19 and verse 5, here's why I want to put such emphasis on this. Because I want to see me, my children, You and your children in this portion of Scripture. And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, And as the voice of mighty thundering saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Listen, I cannot wait for the day where you and I will surround the throne with believers from every other age. Those who have been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. Those who have been made alive by His Spirit. And together we will stand around the throne. It won't even matter that they came from a Roman culture or they were a barbarian. It will not matter whether you're black, white, rich, poor. There's not a black section and a white section. You can't buy a better seat in heaven. We're all going to be on one level. It won't even matter male or female, bond nor free, Jew nor Gentile. But 
we will be one. Uh, we'll be one with the believers of all ages. There will be one Lord, uh, one faith. Uh, that one baptism will have already been accomplished. Uh, and now the bride will forever be with the groom uh, and with believers of all ages. Uh, the doctrine didn't change uh, throughout the ages, but with the believers of all ages uh, that have held true to the foundation of the church, uh, we will stand uh, around the throne of the Lamb uh, and declare hallelujah for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Uh, would you lift your hands in this place right now and would you thank Him? Uh, would you thank Him for the understanding uh, of His Word? Would you thank Him uh, for the truth of His Word? Would you thank Him uh, for helping you and I to know uh, that there's only one Lord, uh, one faith, one baptism, uh, and you and I can hold uh, to the apostles' doctrine. Hallelujah.